It was very kind of him to actually entertain us before. Uh, and I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight, uh, considering the weather in California. The moment it rains, it becomes uh, impossible to leave the house. But I want to open it with something totally different than normal lectures go. So I'm just going to give you a preview how we're going to go tonight. So it's not going to be that much about presentation. So first part of the lecture, I would like to introduce you to uh, parts of my book. It's called Practical Manual for Changing Subjective Reality. After which, I will actually show you a couple of techniques that you can actually, when you leave here, you'll be able to apply them right away. And whoever wants, so first part of the lecture, I would like to introduce you to technique and show you step by step. You can take a photo of it or I, you can send me an email. I will forward you all the materials so you can apply it to your friends and family. One of the techniques will be how to change, uh, how to remove any physical pain whose cause is psychosomatic. So literally in less than five minutes, you're going to be able to remove the physical pain without any touch or without any medication, literally. The second technique I'm going to do here tonight is also show you, you're going to exercise and see that when we talk to other people, you're actually always referring to yourself. But it's one thing when people tell you and you know that on a cognitive level, another thing is when you're experiencing it. And the third exercise is also part of the fair technique, and that's going to be a surprise, but that's the best part. So are you guys okay with that? Also, people who know me, um, they know that most of my seminars, they're like nine to 10 hours average. So I have tendency when I start one subject, I can go into the subject for as long as you like. So please, this is, this is interactive. So just raise your hand, tell me, okay, go back to the place where we started from. Or if you have any questions, you can also stop because this is all for you. I'm here for you tonight. And I wanna make sure that just because you came here on such a bad weather, <laughs> rain, pouring rain in LA, and people actually decided to show up, I wanna make sure there's gonna be a really great night for you so that you actually get something out of this. So first thing we're gonna start is, you guys heard about black swan theory. What I'm gonna talk about tonight, it's something that is so obvious that already exists, but it's not that people are not aware of it. So the awareness to the subject that I'm going to talk about, how to change your subjective reality, not that many people are aware how that's done. And everybody's doing it, but from the point of their perspective, it's actually most people think that life is happening to them instead of them creating the life. Those are two different levels, but also there's a third and a fourth level I'm going to talk about just a little bit later. So the idea is for a while people believe that there's only white swans. Not that many people are aware that actually black swan existed. In all the, all, all the school books and everywhere else, people are only talking about white swans. Just to, in 2001, they found out that actually in Australia, there are black swans. They exist as well. So what does that mean? It's not that they appeared out of nowhere suddenly. They were there all along, but people are unaware of their existence. The same thing with the theory I'm going to present to you tonight. So, and also my favorite sentence is mine, once you introduce with a new idea, can never go back to original form. Try to introduce yourself with any idea and then go back to the, and also this whole concept is about clinical psychology. So I'm gonna also quote uh, Carl Jung, who stated, uh, until you make unconscious conscious, it will leave your life and you will call it fate, literally. So my first question to all of you is, does anybody from the audience remember when were you born? Do you, have, do you remember that experience? You do. Okay, was that a memory or the construct? What do you think, what was it? No, I, I remember being... The, most people don't remember the moment they're born and the reason why is because from zero to two, our brain waves are in theta waves. After that, theta and delta. And uh, that's a phase where we actually adopt everything from our epigenetics, around, from our environment. So my next question will be, do you know who you really are? How most, if I'm gonna ask you who you are, what, what would be the first answer you will give me? Who are you? Human being, what else? Spirit. Spirit. I would tell you my name. Your name, okay, what else? Who are you? Your 
I'm sorry, what? No, because most people do not remember the moment when they're born. So the next question I will ask is actually, if you don't remember the moment when you were born, do you know where you came from? And do you guys know where you go after you leave this body from this, whatever we are, this projection or hologram that we are? So I'm just going to put things in perspective to make it simple for you guys. So this is what they were presented to us as a known universe. So when you ask, when we'll ask you, okay, where are you located right now? Let's say you are in World of Astoria. World of Astoria, it's in Beverly Hills. That's in California. California is in the United States. It's in the Earth. Then Earth is in the solar system. Solar system is in the Milky Way. Milky Way, it's a known universe. But where is the location of that known universe? Do you know where is the location of the known universe? Let's put that black hole. <laughs> OK. So the point of everything, what I want to, I just want to put things in perspective. The no, most of the time, what most people are unaware of, we're thinking about us as being something solid and local, but in reality, everything is energy and motion. So this is easy as picture. To, Mark says, I might not do a presentation, but the picture I think talks, talks a thousand words. When you understand that who we really are and what is this all about, it gives you a little bit more perspective what your cap capacities are as well. So where's your mind? Where's your mind located? Most people say my mind is in my brain. Most people think the brain is a receptor, so that our mind is really not where we think it is. Because most people think, where are your memories? They say in your brain. But if I take your brain and slice it, you think I will find one place in your brain where the memory when you were five years old is located? No, such a thing doesn't exist. So, and if you think about it from the very beginning, whatever we know, from the quarks to the known universe, you have electrons, atoms, molecules, cells, tissues, organs, and that goes to populations, ecosystems, and everything else all the way to down to known universe. But the reality, the reason why I post it this way, just to make you think for a second, because what we think that is local, it's actually non-local. You think that you are local and solid, but you are non-local. But the reality is the microsystem reflect, I'm just gonna go very fast over this because I wanna get to the technique, but the microcosm reflects the microcosm. And they're both, a whole, because most of a uh, qu simple question that most children ask: What was first, chicken or the egg? Nobody thought of that question or the answer. So they say it's a whole. They're both in the same time. What was first, the mother or the child? So when you think about these things, they're actually existential and very, very important things. Everything that exists and everything that we consider to be material, including emotions, which is actually a subject of our concept tonight. Everything manifests in a way that actually sparks a sp spiritual consciousness. So everything is part of that consciousness. Some people call it God, universe consciousness, chi, prana, the life force, whatever you call it, whatever name you use for it. But that's the whole. That's what's local and non-local. That's what's you and your environment. Because even when we describe a human being, we cannot describe a human being without describing the environment. So you're saying human being in correlationship to its environment. So who, what is consciousness? Most people say consciousness is just awareness. And, but that awareness does not exist without the observer. So who is the observer of your reality? I am. You are. OK. And what is your, if you're observing something, what is the thing that you're observing? So you have the observer and the observe. So it, that's that wholeness. So you one and the other. Because the reality depends on the observer, depends who's watching you. Let's say you're watching me right now. If you have healthy vision 2020, maybe you can register 20 to 24 frames per second. While in reality, every cell of my body comes and goes faster than the speed of light. So in reality, whatever is faster than 50 milliseconds, you cannot really register with your brain. You have no capacity for something like that. So, and by the way, I just have to say, every TV today has 120 frames per second. 
if you can register only 20 to 24 frames, what's in the other 90 something frames they're serving you that's faster than 50 milliseconds? It's not all Pepsi, Coca-Cola, and toothpaste. There's other stuff as well. By the way, after 9-11, the government approved the subliminal conditioning as well. It's legally approved. So the reality depends who's observing it. And everybody's reality is real. But what I'm, what I'm, when I'm saying everybody's reality is real from their point of view. And the reality that has the most energy is the reality that's most consistent with everybody else. And that's why people put so much energy and money into marketing. So they want you to believe into their reality because the moment you start putting your energy, because it's all about energy, the moment you start putting your energy in somebody else's reality, that reality becomes more real than yours. And sooner or later becomes something that you actually are living as well. Because for whatever belief that you have right now, you have to find a proof. So let's say you say, you buy, everybody talks about this, you buy the red car, you go outside, you think nobody has a red car, but the moment you bought it, you pay attention, you're actually putting your awareness into it, you see red cars everywhere. I have one friend, he said, oh, when I was selling real estate, everybody was a realtor. And when I'm doing whatever he's doing right now, everybody's doing the same thing. So whatever you put your focus on, that's what expands. So the law of attraction and other laws that people mostly follow in this country, focuses only on a positive. Focusing on a positive is basically living half life because you are whole, you're plus and minus. One does not exist without the other because we express into duality. But before we go there, this is what I wanted to show you. Picture, this is a part of a cosmos and the other one is part of a cell every cell in your body. So it gives you an idea that basically they look, look the same. If you take a telescope, and the better the telescope and the higher you go, you're gonna find more and more things, or create them in a process, or they're gonna be nothing out there. When you take a microscope, the better the microscope you have, you're gonna go deeper and deeper into every cell of your body, and you're gonna find what? Nothing. We go into deeper and deeper stuff. At the end, there's nothing really and nothing there. But what's that nothing? out of which everything is born from. That's that consciousness. That's the energy that we're talking about. Physical universe, including the world that we create with our own energy. Some people say it's an illusion, but that's what I'm saying. Whatever you put your energy, that's what grows, but not from a conscience, but from your unconscious. And most of the time, let's say I say, oh, I wanna be successful. So. If I'm saying on a conscious level I want to be successful, and I'm putting all my focus and energy on that, but what's opposite of that? Opposite of success is like I'm not good enough, I don't belong, I don't deserve, I'm not worth it, whatever that is. And those are the things that we normally hold which are opposite, because in this expression of duality, whatever exists has its own opposites. Let's say I want to be a good girl. In order for me to experience myself as a good girl, somebody has to be bad. Otherwise, I cannot have experience of a good girl. In order for me to experience myself as being a tall woman, somebody has to be short. Otherwise, I don't have the experience of a tall woman. Like somebody say, you're very tall, but when I go back home and I stand next to my brothers, I feel like a tiny little thing. So it all depends what you compare it with. Dobrodošla. <laughs> Welcome. Here we go. We can only experience our perception of reality. And again, the most, how we change our subject, I'm gonna go into subject, how we change our subjective reality, but I'm just slowly entering into the concept that you come to your own conclusion by yourself. So here's a small exercise. Can you all close your eyes? For an example, open your arms, your legs, and your mind. And now I'm gonna ask you a question. Where is your next thought coming from? From which side? Does it come from the left? Is it coming from the right? Does it come from the top, from the bottom, from the front, from the back? Where is your next thought coming from? Wait for it. Wait for your next thought and tell me, where does it coming from?
Most people will not have any thoughts. That's the fastest way to get in a meditation state. You don't need to meditate 40 minutes or chant some different words. By the way, when you do transcendental meditation, uh, what you do, we give you the word that has no meaning to it. And you repeat that word over and over again in order to get to the state of calmness. We don't give you the word that has a lot of uh, energy of emotional charge or tension to it. We don't give you the word mom or dad or brother or sister or your lover, because that word has a lot of attention, attention to it attached. So we choose the word that has no meaning whatsoever. You focus on that word until you come to that point. But this small exercise that I just gave you, you can utilize it at any point when you are um, in a panic or something, you want to calm yourself. All you have to do is close your eyes and ask yourself, where is my next thought coming from? Very simple as that. So when it comes to reality, how we create reality, I think the algorithm is actually imitating the consciousness in one way or the other. I have a girlfriend of mine, I thought she's going to be here tonight, and she said, listen, whatever you see on your phone, because I was talking about something that was very active in my mind at the time, in my reality, and I was sharing that with her, and she said, listen, your algorithm, whatever you see on your phone, I cannot see, because algorithm that you have that's geared towards your, your phone or your computer, it's completely different than mine. Have you noticed, like, if you, for example, you buy one book, and then all of a sudden the computer's sending you that author or anything that's similar to the book that you already purchased? So that's basically the algorithm is choosing for you, and somehow, indirectly, it's gearing you towards your new perception and your new reality. The AI is taking slowly, but surely, because at the beginning, we're gonna rely on it to get some information like chat GDB or open AI, for example. So at the beginning, you rely on it, and you trust it more and more, and all of a sudden, it will indirectly gear you to the perception that they want you to be at. Indirectly, indirectly, we become very dependent on the AI. But why? Why is all of this done? Because somebody's reality wants to be more real than your own. Because nobody wants you to know how powerful you really are. Because if everybody really will know who they really, really are and what they have within, I'm not talking about the body. I'm not talking about the name. I'm not talking about identification. She's an architect, she's a psychologist, she's a cook, she's a driver, she's a whatever. We have so many identifications during the life. I'm talking about who you really are, what's within you. What's within you that actually expresses, oh, by the way, the, real, the difference between objective reality and subjective reality is objective, uh, objective reality is basically the idea that there's an external truth that you have nothing to do with it. It's something that's served to you, by the way. While subjective reality is filtered by your own perceptions, filters, and uh, actually how you've been brought. And nobody's perception is the same. Not one person has the same perception of filters because your filters are being built in your childhood from zero to seven. Let's say you're born and then all of a sudden you grew up in an environment that Let's say your aunt comes to you and she says, oh my God, you're so shy. What is she doing? She's projecting her own shyness onto me. At the beginning, I don't believe I'm shy, but after a while, I go into first grade and the guy that I like, he doesn't like me, he likes my friend. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm shy. And then all of a sudden, I start finding more proof and proof that I'm shy. And then I'm 19, or I meet somebody I like very much, and he's like, oh, well, let's go on a date. I'm like, oh, I'm shy. So. Is anybody there who's born with the shy genes? Such a thing doesn't exist. But it's something that I adopted and I believe that that's who I am. None of the identifications that you have right now, none of it, it's yours. Whatever you believe that you are right now, none of it is yours. The more identifications you have, the further away from your core you go. The further away from who you really are, you go. Every aspect of creation is basically mold of energy. What's the most important thing in life? It's the energy. People, other people and associations, or whatever you call them, let's call them corporations, they need your energy. They need your energy in order for their reality to be real. They don't really need money or anything. There's plenty of money that's needed, but they need your energy. For example, when this vaccination thing happened or whatever, half people were for it, half people were against it. Either way, we all were feeding that project. I call it project. 
So, come on in. So what happens, it doesn't matter if you were against it or if you were for it. You were feeding it both ways. So that's why there was so much marketing. Because remember, there were previous years where people were, um, there were vaccines for this and that for everything, but the marketing wasn't that great. Yeah? And the government wasn't involved. So what happens is that the more marketing they have, the more they don't need your money. They want your energy because once you put your energy into something, their reality becomes more real than yours. And nobody wants you to know how powerful you are and that you are actually creating their reality. So there's a difference. I did the same thing. For example, there was a reality that I was feeding for a while that somebody wants to make a shortage in food and control the water and this and that. And I'm thinking, and then I was, I was in my mind, or my, I was putting my energy into it. And I was saying, oh, I'm against it. I have to protect myself. I have to find a way how to, uh, I have to find a, a land and build a house on it so I can be self-sufficient. I want to build a house that's self-sufficient as well by itself. But in reality, what I was doing with it, I was feeding that reality that had the fear installed into me. So with my fear, I was feeding somebody else's reality instead of me focusing on something that I want, something that's desirable for me. So whichever reality has the most energy, that's the reality that becomes more real than all the others. This is something that nobody told me when I was younger, is that two things were given to us as human beings. First thing is that you are creator. You always create. Sometimes you create from the suppressed emotions or suppressed content that you carry within yourself. And sometimes you are creating from desirable state. That's the law of attraction, whatever they're promoting. And promotion of the things that you supposed to create something from desirable state doesn't really work if you have any suppressed emotions. If you carry anything that's opposite of that desirable thing, you have internal conflict and you will never have the thing that you, want, that you desire on a conscious level. There will always be that unconscious thing that's blocking you and holding you back. Another thing that I put here, people say, so why am I here? What's the point of me here, being here? We're here for the experience. You're not here to learn anything new. Because this seminar is gonna to be totally, totally different than most of other workshops that you go to. Because everywhere else you go, people will say, okay, come sign for this workshop, and I'm gonna teach you how you're gonna be like successful, powerful, this and this and then whatever. So you create another identification on top of the ones that you already carry with yourself. So this workshop is going to be different. I'm going to ask you to de disidentify from everything you ever built till now. Because when you come down to that core of who you really are, what's base of that consciousness, God, universe, call it any way you want, the core of that is just love and peace. So once you remove all the identifications, the more degrees or identifications you have, the further away from your core you are. So these techniques literally allow you to remove energy of emotional charge, that's that intensive tension. And once you remove that, in, that energy of emotional charge from identifications and you no longer identify with anything, in that case, you are free to be whoever you wanna be in a situation that you're supposed to be. Let's say, simple example. Let's say I have an identification of a hot lover and I have an identification of a good daughter. So, these two, every identification has its own, what, goals and defeating message and a point of view. So let's say I want to be, I'm with a man of my dreams or man of my life, whatever you call it, and I want to be a hot lover with him. But if in that moment, which is opposite of identification of a good daughter, the identification of the good daughter is activated, then I cannot be a hot lover then you become shy and you be different. And we all have so many identifications that have opposite goals. And every time we have opposite goals, what happens? We have an internal conflict. So with these techniques, we remove those internal conflicts and uh, you come down to the core self. And the base of every living being, I'm talking about everybody, including your biggest enemy, is that base of source, and that source is just pure love and peace.
They call it godly peace and love. So believe it or not, everything that's not love and peace, it's a construct that we live and we create as our reality. So you're not here to learn anything new because when you come to that place of oneness, to that place of source, where it's just love and peace, all the knowledge is accessible to you. Then you're wondering, why did I go to school? Why did I educate myself? Why did I build so much? When, once you remove all of that, and another thing what most people who study with me, they say they become clairvoyant. You always were clairvoyant. You could always see everything because everything is accessible to you. But most people carry so much energy of emotional charge or that tension in them, they cannot see a finger in front of their face. That's how much they identify with something and that's what they believe that is their reality. That's what they believe it's truth for them. So, there's, in reality, there's not, nothing really to learn. So when people say that oneness and duality, what do you mean by that? Oneness is always present. Let's say this screen here on the back is the oneness, and the slides that I'm presenting to you, it's duality. They're basically the same experience. We're here for the experience. You have indirect and direct experience. Indirect experience is when we have subject and object. And direct experience when there's nothing, just you, that one. In oneness, there's no two. In oneness, there's not you and God. It's not, in oneness, it's not you and your husband or you and your wife. In oneness, there's only one. One whose base is love and peace. That's what oneness is. And duality is what makes this game possible of the expression for the experience. Why the experience? So you know how it feels. Like when somebody touches you. Although, just so you know, when somebody touches you, nobody re nothing really touches anything. Those are just electrical stimuluses and impulses. Oneness is expressed in duality. I call it trinity. Why? Because everything that exists in, one, in duality has its opposite. Let's say, okay, I'm gonna hold it this way. So let's say that good and bad, or what's the opposite of love? Opposite of love, I'm talking about emotion, not the state, because let me just define this very clearly. The, the oneness or that place of source, it's state of love and peace, not the emotion, it's the state. The emotion of love and peace is what we play with in duality. So let's say the opposite, you have somebody, let's say I, I love somebody else, or and I hate somebody else. Once I remove energy and emotional charge from these two polarities, they become one, which they were from the very beginning. It's like a coin with two sides. One side is plus, the other one is minus. It's like a magnet. Every cell in your body has plus and minus. Otherwise, you will not be here in, in this expression, duality. Let's say I'm here in Beverly Hills right now. So I go to sleep tonight and I dream that I'm back in Montenegro on a boat and my legs are in the water and I feel that water and I feel that sun on my face and I hear the noise in the back and I may, maybe even talk about with somebody in my dream. Uh, have we, how many people have experienced dreams so well that when you woke up, you were still under the influence of that emotion? Even pain. Even pain. Sometimes you go to sleep in your dream, something's like hurt, hurtful for you, and then you wake up in the morning and the whole day you're feeling pain in that part of the body. And even though it was a dream. Same thing with us. So let's say I'm dreaming that I'm in Montenegro on that boat with my, water, with my feet in the water, and in the morning when I wake up, that Tatiana that was in a dream, she never knew that Tatiana in Beverly Hills existed. The one that was in Montenegro in a dream. Do you see what I'm saying? So I'm dreaming, or let's say you're dreaming that you are in Fiji with the love of your, of your life and you're here in Beverly Hills. While you're in that Fiji and you're feeling the water and the sun and you chit-chatting with your lover or arguing with him, whatever, it doesn't matter what the story is in your dream, that dream seems so real to you that nothing else exists. But when you wake up, you say, wow, what a dream, or wow, what a game. Same thing is going to happen when you leave this expression of duality, this body that you're in right now. So most people have heard that the power of 
drop is in the ocean, but not that many people are aware that power of ocean is in each drop. So I like to compare when people ask me who you are, I would say I'm that drop from the ocean. Or most people who have experienced DMT or ayahuasca or something like that, so when they have that DMT experience, which by the way is produced by your pineal gland, every night you go to sleep, that's how you end up. And the difference between melatonin and DMT, it's only one, it's a carbon uh, CO2, that's the only difference between these two. So, when you have that drop, when that drop exists separate from the ocean, it thinks it is separate and has the experience of itself as a separate entity. But the moment when that drop touches the ocean and becomes the ocean, it still might think that it's dropped for a second until it blends in and says, wow, I am that ocean. Same thing happens to us when we leave this body that we're in. And let's say I'm identifying most of us who have done a lot of different ex exercises have experienced this and can relate to this. Let's say you're doing exercise of entering to the oneness. For a while, I know it's me, Tatiana, but then after a while I understand, no, I'm not the entity of Tatiana any longer. I'm part of, F of that one, that one that there, where there's no two. There's only oneness. And you understand that, yeah, if I'm part of that oneness and everybody around me is part of that same oneness, we are all one and one is all. There's no difference between you and me. Different shape and color, but it's the same thing. It's the same source that's in all of us. So, most people say, so what's the goal of, the, of this life? What's the purpose of this life? You know, this duality, why we're here? What's the meaning? Meaning is that there's no meaning, really. Meaning is the only meaning that you give it. And the moment you give it meaning, then you live it as reality, and it becomes reality for you. Simple as that. And everything starts from identifications. Once you identify with things, you believe that that's who you are. And you invest your what? energy into it. Once you invent the energy, what are you doing? You are creating it. Simple as that. But when you understand who you really, really are, life changes completely. The same food, different tastes. Same people, different relationships. Your life is completely different from that point on. Why? Because then you become observer and the observed. You live in balance and you're aware that you are that oneness that's expressed into duality. And then you are whole. Then one thing I'm going to tell you right now, and this is the only truth that you're ever going to hear, is that you are perfect. You're perfect just as you are. But the moment you remove your identifications, that is when you feel that perfection, that love and peace that is all of it that exists. Not just you, not just me, but everything, including your biggest enemy. For some people, that's hard to swallow, but we're going to do some small exercise just to understand what it is. Because what we see in other people, oh, by the way, some people, what do you see over there? Some people see old man and old woman. Some people see the singers, the guitar player, and the house, and another woman playing. I see lovers. Lovers, yes. <laughs> so in order to experience yourself, you need others. Imagine you living in a world by yourself. Would that have any sense? No. We express in so many ways, in so many different expressions. Why? In order to get to know who we really are. Who am I? I'm your mirror. I'm you and I'm your mirror. Whatever I see in you, whatever you see in me and you like and you don't like, that's you. That's who you really are. If you're indifferent, there's a big difference. I have to note it. I have to put a note on this. Let's say I say that person is, give me one trait of character trait. Jealous. jealous. Okay. So if I say that person is jealous, and one cell in my body, there's energy of emotional charge or some sort of tension in my body, that means that I have the same. But I cannot see it in myself. I need a mirror. What Alan Watts will say, the eyes cannot see themselves, the lips cannot kiss themselves. You need what? You need a mirror in which you're projecting who you really are. So if you say, if I say I'm jealous and I'm not reacting to it, then it's not my trait. But if I say I'm jealous and something within me, it's activated, there's some sort of intention or tension, intensive tension, 
then that is my trait that normally we cannot see in ourselves, but we can see it everywhere else around us. I had one guy in Belgrade, I was talking about this, I did this same lecture 10 years ago. So there was one guy in Belgrade who came and he said um, that he came to the workshop to learn techniques so he can solve the jealousy because his wife was really impossible to live with, how jealous she was. And um, also everybody in his environment was jealous. So he started working. First thing that happened is we do the sessions first from our point of view. Because consciousness is, let's say you can experience your reality only from your point of view, but the consciousness is a summary of all points of view in the same time. That's what consciousness, as consciousness is, because it's all one and one is all. So what happens when you are projecting yourself, oh, this is a simple photograph, I've just looked at it. So you see this black and white, some people see two faces, some people vase, white vase, yeah? If everything was white, you would see nothing, you will not have the experience. If everything was black, you will see nothing and you will not have experience. So this life is combination of what? Shadows. The black and white combination of something that gives you an idea that you are whole, you are complete, not just one, not the other. But everything, every relationship that you have, it's transactional relationship. In real, everything in life, psychology, mathematics, physics, everything in relationship to something or somebody. Otherwise, there's no experience. Every experience, what we say, we have direct or indirect experience. Everything experience, you sitting now on a chair, that's combination of a subject and the object, you and chair. When you buy and sell something, that's also transactional. You cannot buy unless somebody sells it, or you cannot sell it unless somebody buys it. Same thing in everything that you do. Every relationship that we have, in order to be whole, it's transactional. And one thing that I've experienced, I'm just talking now from my personal experiences, is that sooner or later, everything you talk about or whoever you chit chat or gossip about, you will become and experience that. The higher the level of existence you are, the faster you will experience it. So every time you talk about somebody else, you're literally giving your personal description or something that you're gonna be living very fast from that point on. So the reality, these are the, these are the ways how we perceive the reality to the conscious. I just want to get to the game. As you know, my, I did this portrait, by the way, I do painting and sculpturing as a hobby. That's how I meditate. So um, this is Nikola Tesla, and he stated that everything is perceived, everything that we see and experience is energy, vibration, and frequency. So the moment now, everything is moving to a frequency, even healing, now we have a lot of machines for healing for frequency machines, everybody's aware of those. And most of the people that I work, that I know, who are actually owners of those machines and even inventors, they all come to me. Why? Because they're balanced and everything is great while they're on the actual machine. While frequency is working, they're balancing their, their brain waves, everything is perfect, but the moment they're off of the machine, what happens? The cause gets activated. With fair transformational technique, what we do, we remove the cause. Once the cause is integrated, then there's no reason for the consequences. Because most of people anywhere in the world is, let's say you have insomnia. You go to the doctor, he gives you pills for your insomnia. He doesn't solve the reason why you don't sleep at night. With fair transformational technique, we solve the cause. When there's no cause, then you sleep well at night because there's no consequences. And most of the time, one cause has many consequences. So by solving, let's say you have that insomnia and you solve the cause of that insomnia, other problems that you might have are also going away, disappearing from your life as well. And yin and yang are the simplest thing in, in reality. You have good and bad, and good in bad, and bad in good, you are whole. Everybody is good and bad. The problem is that we, as a human beings, we have, we have culturally, socio social conditioning, it's that way that you're supposed to be good. Dee just sent me one video yesterday, or the day before, where a doctor, what was his name? Gabor. Gabor was talking about that good people get sick or they die. Let's say one person is nice, so nice and so sweet, but they're not authentic with themselves, and they die at the age earlier than 50. 
Why? Because they have not been authentic and they have not been able to accept or admit to themselves they have good and bad within. Because if you think, oh, if I'm a good person and if I see myself, okay, culturally it's accepted that I'm a good person, and then what I'm doing, I'm suppressing the negative emotions, so content within me. What does that do to me? Whatever you, repress, whatever you suppress, persists. Whatever you resist, persists. And whatever you repress becomes stronger because you are feeding that with your own energy. And in order, uh, St. Francis Bacon says, that in order for light to shine brightly, the dark must be present. So the idea of what I'm presenting to you right now, I'm not saying that you should be good or bad, but you should just be accepted, accepting that we have both within. And you one cannot exist without the other. Let me give you an example. If you wanna experience, okay, everybody here has friends who are happy-go-lucky, but you know in reality they're not really happy. How many friends do you have like that? They're like, oh, hi, how are you doing? Everything is cool. But in reality, you know they're miserable. Why? Because you cannot be authentically happy if you have negative emotions suppressed. Why? Because you're wasting your own energy by suppressing that negative content, by not admitting it that that's who you are, that's, what, that's who we all are. But it cannot be, it has to be integrated in order to, this is a completely different concept than just focusing on positive, positive, positive. I have a lot of friends who are in a positive movement and they're literally flying, they're not even touching the ground, but when they hit the ground, you can't get them off the floor for a long, long time. Why? Because it's very, um, they're only living half-life. Only what people say, spiritual naive people think that you can only live half-life, you can only be positive. One and the other are okay, but here's the thing. When you integrate the energy of emotional charge from the negative, then you can experience the opposite. So the same intensity from which you are suppressing something in your life. Let me give you a simple example. Let's say you're three years old and you're playing with your Legos. Okay, so some authority comes in the house, brother, mother, older siblings, it doesn't matter who comes in, and they're in a bad mood. They walk by your toys and they're turned down. In that moment, normal reaction is for you to say, hey, what are you doing? And you become angry because you were playing with those toys. You were making that castle for two hours and that authority comes and ruins your, ruins your toys. And the normal reaction is to be angry. But you decide not to be angry. You suppress that emotion because if you show your anger, you're gonna get beaten up. So for you not to get beaten up, you, what you do, you suppress that anger. And then you go to the first grade, that anger, what? Remember at the beginning, everything is energy in motion. Everything that exists has a beginning, experience, and the end. Your body has the beginning, experience, and the end. But everything, that, including every emotion. So let's say some emotion is born out of nothing. So that beginning, let's say I have the emotion of the anger that I've been suppressing since I was three years old because somebody played with my toys or didn't, I, I didn't react to it the way I was supposed to. So I go in a first, first grade and then all of a sudden the anger shows up when I least expect it. Why is this happening when it leaks suspect? Because that, that emotion is also live like we are, like everything else. So that emotion is creating circumstances in my life in order to be integrated, in order for me to, what? To acknowledge it, that exists, to recognize it, to experience it, and then to integrate it, and then disappears from your life forever. So that's the process that has to happen from everything that exists from living being to emotions to you name it. Anything, anything that's energy and everything is energy. So that energy is stuck, but it's not stuck by itself. I am the one holding it down. I am the one holding that emotion in prison. Why? Because God forbid somebody sees me as angry person. I'm not allowed to be angry. Why? Because it's not culturally accepted. I was brought up to be a good girl. You're not supposed to be angry. So what happens? That anger creates circumstances, not other people. 
Other people are just mirrors. You cannot play your own unconscious game by yourself. You need mirrors. So, all of a sudden, somebody else who has the same or complementary game shows up in your life, and what we do? We blame them. That, bah, whatever, that person, you know, that she's mean, she's this and that, she made me angry. I was just talking to one lady, she just said, oh, I don't have any problems, but this woman made me so angry. I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. Where is the anger? She said, she made me angry. I said, no, 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 who's carrying the anger? She said, oh, let, let, let me think. It took her like two, three minutes. She said, oh, I have anger in me. I'm like, okay, so if you carry anger within yourself, that woman was just a trigger. And she's an angel of transformation to let you know what's within you that's ready to be integrated. But you are the one who's ignoring it. So what happens, you don't react to that anger. You say, oh, you get out of my life. So you get rid of that woman or man, whatever, yeah? You move on, somebody else, the same story over and over. That's the reason why we have repetitive stories over and over again, all the time, until we allow the integration of that content. And how many people do you have who play the same drama, different acting crowd? Everybody does, why? But what we do, we blame them. Because it's so much easier, what we said before, it's easier to think, see things in others than to actually admit that we are the same. So whatever I say about anybody else, when people, by the way, I'm in architecture, <laughs> my business is architecture, this is my hobby. But, so when people come to my work uh, to apply for a job, I ask them only two questions. Give me five traits of people, what you liked about people where you worked before. They say, okay, they're like this, this, and this, and this, okay, great. Give me five traits you did not like about them. Oh, they're late, they're, never, they're not respectful, they're this and that. So when they give me traits of what they like about other people, they're telling me how they are when they're balanced. When they're giving me five traits of people they did not like, they're giving me their description how they are when they're out of balance. So simple. We are always talking about ourselves. Always. So I'd like to do some exercise. Is anybody here in the audience who has somebody who they hate so much? And I'm going to ask her, this is a small exercise. This thing does not solve your problem, but will give you awareness. I'm going to show how it's done on her. And then after that, we can share, uh, we can pair in twos, and you can tr experience this yourself. Can we do that? We are all identify with everything. In the morning you wake up, you have identification of a good lover, if you slept with your partner. Then you go to a kitchen, you have identification of a cook. You sit in a car, you have identification of a driver. Your mother calls, you have identification of a son or daughter. Your child calls, you have identification of a parent. So we juggle with so many identifications just in the daytime that it's very hard for you to remember who you really are. Who you really are, it's not identifications. Who you are is that source, that oneness, that's part of this duality. Oneness, it's never gone. It's not like, oh, most people say, oh, I'm going to find myself. I'm going to this tour, I'm going to this course, and I'm gonna go find myself. Find me one person, try to step outside of yourself to find yourself. No, you have to go inward. You have to go towards yourself to who you really are. So with fair transformational technique, what we do, we remove energy of emotional charge from any identification that you hold so dear right now. So when you remove energy and emotional charge from it, or that tension, then you can express yourself in that identification or not. But you'll be fine both ways. You're not attached to anything or anybody. You understand that everything in your reality is just what? Here for the purpose of the experience. You don't need any knowledge. You know, every, because U.S. is mecca of seminars and workshops. They're going to teach you everything and anything. But if you have suppressed emotions or suppressed content, you cannot succeed. So the only way to succeed in life, if you do integration of suppressed content that we've been carrying with us since the childhood, because those are the same repetitive story over and over again. 
And most of the time, you play the roles of victim. Then from a victim, you become a prosecutor. Because first, we complain, poor me. And then we start blaming that somebody. And you become a prosecutor. And then, when you're done with that game, you become what? A savior. You have to save somebody who's going through the same stuff that you're going through. So that cycle goes, and then you become a judge, of course. That's unavoidable. So you go from these cycles over and over again, from one to the other. So what we do in fair technique, we eliminate energy of emotional charge or integration. There's no elimination. Integrate it within yourself, accepting that that's who we are. We remove energy, emotional charge, and then you live your life in peace and love. And from that point on, all the knowledge is accessible to you. So then you don't have to learn anything and you don't have to identify with anything or anybody. That's true freedom. So water can be described in so many words, but until you drink that water or until you enter the water, you don't have the experience of the water. So I would like to share with you one technique Oh, by the way, the fair transformational technique is a psychological method that allows you to solve literally any personal problem, literally, by elimination of energy and emotional charge. So this is how we define any problem. This is not attached only to fair, but to anything in life. This is the easiest way for you to find out how you're going to define any problem. Before we start solving the problem, we have to define it. Every problem has situation and reaction. Let's say somebody comes to you and they say, oh, I'm feeling angry today. They give you what? They give you reaction. In order to get a situation, you ask them about whom or what are you angry about, or whatever. And if they, if they tell you, um, oh, today at school, at work, at the politics, whatever, and then you ask, how do you feel about that? Most people will say, um, I, I know some, I have some friend, and I say, okay, I can solve anything for you, pick and choose anything. He said, oh, I'm, I want to solve the peace. In, there's no peace in the world. What is that? That's objective problem. We don't solve objective problems. We solve subjective problems. Subjective problem is a personal problem. What does that mean? That means how can somebody shift the back? Thank you. Subjective problem means how I feel about that. So if I say, OK, there's no peace in the world, we cannot solve that problem. But we can solve how you feel about that, that there's no peace in the world. Oh, I feel angry because there's no peace in the world. That we can solve for you. So any definition of any problem has situation and reaction. So what I wanted to say, I just want to use the Hope and Opono example. There's a doctor, I forgot his name, uh, Han Len, Hugh Len, I don't know. He worked in a mental hospital. And what he did, he worked with his third patients. And basically, he didn't treat them. What he did, he took their charts. So he worked in a hospital for three years. In these three years, all the patients were, it's a prison, uh, prison mental hospital. And all the patients were discharged. Why? Because they all got better. And he never saw any of his patients. What he did, he took their charts, and then he went to their charts, and he felt how I feel about their diagnosis. And then whatever he felt in the moment, when he, what he felt when he read their diagnosis, he integrated that and more energy and emotional charge from that that he had within himself. And then miraculously, all the patients got better. Three years later, they had no, that, sh that sector of the hospital was closed. There was no need for it. Reason why? Because he understands that we are whole. There's no difference between you and me or anybody else. So most people say, be the change that Gandhi says, be the change you want to see in the world. And Joe Vitale said, that's the hard to swallow. That's the hardest thing to swallow, that you are actually responsible for everything in your reality. But that is your subjective reality, and it's here for you to experience it. So whatever I like or I don't like about somebody else, when I integrate that within me, that literally disappears from my subjective reality. But literally. Why and how? Very simple. So let's say I'm going to give an example of one of my friends here in LA. So I, six months I'm in Europe, Montenegro for summer, winters I'm here. So every time I come here, um, she, my friend, let's call her ex-girlfriend, 
uh, I mean, she's not an ex, let's call her Y girlfriend. And then she, every time I meet with her for three years in a row, she will complain about her neighbor. Her neighbor was the meanest, the ugliest, the da da da, whatever. And they were suing each other for a period of a couple of years. And when I met with the girl Y, I will say, listen, do you have any other subject? Because I don't know why is this part of my reality. And what I did, I said, okay. I went home and I was like, Tatiana, how do you feel about this? How is she part of your reality? And then I feel, I feel sad, and then I reintegrate sadness into my life, and then I didn't see Miss Y for a very long time. She literally disappeared from my reality. And she wouldn't do any session because she was good and her neighbor was bad, by the way. She, everything she did was right and good, but the things that her neighbor was doing to her was impossible. And then after two years, she, said, she calls me up, she said, oh, listen, I want to try that session with you. Okay, I did a session with her, and then I went to Europe for a whole summer. I come back the next winter, she's nice and happy, she's not even mentioning a name of her neighbor. And then I'm like, hey, what happened to your neighbor? She said, oh, I don't know, I haven't seen her in six months. What happened? Every time you remove energy and emotional charge from something, you move on a higher level of frequency of existence, and that person that was on the same level where you were, if you do not integrate energy emotional charge from that person as well, you can never meet. Even though if you live door to door, which these two girls live door to door, literally. And they, accidentally, they can never meet each other. Why? Because they don't have the same or complementary what? Content that keeps them together, that keeps them in the same game. Because once you heal what you do, you go to different reality. It's the same earth but it's a different reality. And in your reality, you can never meet anybody who doesn't have the same content as you do. So every time, as Roberto Sajolo will say, every time you solve a problem, you go on a higher level of consciousness and you go higher and higher. I will say go, go deeper and deeper in your core self, which is pure love and peace. And another thing's gonna happen to you when you do fair technique. Oh, by the way, I, I took this just to explain, I think this reality that we live in some sort of hologram because hologram is whole in each of its parts. So you are whole as a person, as a part of that consciousness that's in all of us. So you are complete and whole. There's nothing that's missing within you. And then when, you, when that part of hologram, it becomes that big hologram, it understands it's one and always was and always is and always will be. This is just a temporary expression of who you are. But another thing that's interesting that we all have experienced is that once I solve something in my life, my, all my previous generations and my future generations are released from the same thing that I integrated. So all of you people who are here in the room are basically angels of transformation, literally. And you are chosen for your whole, how do you call it, ancestors or future generations to heal them. There's no coincidences. You're not here accidentally. On a day like this to come out, on a day like this in Los Angeles, it's unheard of to have a full room of people on a weather like this. Why? You came here with a purpose. It's no coincidences. Whatever I'm saying right now is what is this? My words are basically you talking to yourself through me. I'm just a mirror. Whatever I'm saying, it's something that you need to hear right now. All, everything that comes from me, it's your message to you. So this has nothing to do with some external process. You're creating everything, including this podium, this hotel, this room, uh, this presentation. Everything is your creation, one way or the other. So, and then, this is another thing that I wanted to show. Remember that Tom Cruise, when he does this, thing, moving computer left and right, where did they get that from? From our body. Because everything that happens to you, it's registered in your body. Every emotion has its own location. And your body can handle it only for so much, that's how we get ill. You store so much anger into something. So everything is frequency and vibration. I said energy and movement. So this is the list that gives you frequency of the emotions and the frequency of the body parts. And your body produces enough energy when you balance your electromagnetic field, it's 90 centimeters to meter 20. And the energy goes inward. It goes like a torus. It has a torus shape. Everything has a torus shape, by the way, all the energy. So what happens when you're balanced, 
it's meter, 90 centimeters to meter 20, but when you're out of balance, it's three meter 45. So it's all the way down to that door. Who are you feeding with your own energy when you're out of balance? And if you think about it, the whole system is set up that way. They, they want you to be out of balance so you can feed somebody else. What? Could you go back to for a quick second? So every emotion, it's on certain frequency, and that tells you also how much energy you have to use to suppress that thing. And how much are you taking from your functioning, from your body properly functioning in order to suppress that emotion. And then, of course, every part of the body corresponds to certain psychosomatic. You tell me what hurts, I tell you what's the cause of it. What's the emotion that's hidden? Let's say I was this was the first presentation I'm doing of Fair Technique here, and I actually organized this by myself with, with help of a lot of people here. But at one point, two days ago, I got up and I had a shoulder pain on my left side. And what does that mean? I felt emotionally unsupported. Do you see what happened? Like I had to, and then I had the subject, and then I asked myself, what is this all about? The subject that came up was, I have to do everything by myself. The moment I did session on myself, I have to do everything by myself. At the same time, like when I just finished the session, I got a call from Mark Anthony, a friend of mine here. And he's like, do you need any help? First thing, after Mark Anthony, the camera guy showed up. Then Kevin calls me up, he said, do you need anything else? The same night, I had four phone calls of my friends asking, do you need any help with your workshop? That's how fast the technique works. It works during the session. For example, when I have a lot of people come for, in, for personal relationships. I'm sorry, you should tell me to move <laughs> so you can take a photo. So let's say a woman comes and has a problem with her husband or vice versa, it doesn't matter. And then during the session, while she's integrating that energy and emotional charge, her partner calls to apologize, to take them out for vacation, to buy them a gift or whatever, but their relationship is transformed. I have so many cases in Europe when people come to workshop, they do the session interpersonal problems with somebody else, and then they go home and that person is waiting for them and giving them hug and love. It's the same person, but it's completely different relationship. And so this is technique I want to show. With, is anybody here that has any pain, any physical pain, acute pain? Anybody who's in pain here? Yes. Right now, is anybody here that have pain right now? Yes. Okay. How strong is from zero to ten? Zero to no pain. Ten, you want to explode. Okay. And the lady next to you. Yeah. How strong is that? Six. Six. Okay. Because you came here as a to perform, so they're gonna think that I know you. Although we just met. <laughs> Can I take somebody I never met before? Is that be okay? Okay. Would you like to come? Cool. I only say officially that this works on psychosomatic, uh, pain whose uh, cause is psychosomatic. But I have people in my group, I have a couple of thousands of people in different groups that I work with daily. They claim that it works also like when you hit yourself or something like that. I don't, I, I don't promise that, but I know that it works on psychosomatic causes. So with this good and bad it's part of everybody you cannot have good without bad and a bad without good it doesn't exist we are conditioned in our childhood from zero to seven and everything that you have right now it's unresolved issues that you haven't solved in your childhood literally uh, every relationship it's here for the purpose of healing every relationship in your life so it doesn't matter how you perceive that relationship if you don't heal with the person that's next to you the next one, you can get rid of them, but the next one that comes along, you will have exactly the same content because it's not about them. It's about the stuff that you hold in prison within yourself and that you are keeping that energy. You're wasting your own energy. And by the way, some people say, oh, that person is like energy vampire. Such thing doesn't exist because we are the one who are wasting our own energy. When we see somebody we don't like and we say, oh, I'm so drained after this person, it's not that they drain you. Only 1% of people on the planet know how to deal with energy specifically. The rest of people, what we do is like, oh, this person is draining my energy. No, I'm draining my own energy because I don't want to identify with the things that drive me crazy about her. 
So those are the things that I can see in her and everybody else, but I'm incapable of seeing in myself. So the moment when I heal it within myself, that person's gonna be the happiest person in my life because that person is literally the angel of transformation that came in my life to make me aware of what's within me that's asking and that's ready for integration. And it's a Pandora box. It's not just one thing or two. There's a bunch of things. So persona, everybody knows this. Persona is basically a word that says, I identify with this and I want to be that, that, got, that and that kind of person. But in reality, every time you say, I want to build this personality, you're saying, I want to be a fake person. Because persona, the origin of the word comes from a mask. And you hold different masks in every different environment because you know what happens. You're not the same person in the eyes of your mother. You're not the same person in the eyes of your lover, in the eyes of your friends, in the eyes of whoever. Everybody sees you differently. So reason why they see you differently because they can only see themselves in you. And I put this mirror, um, the funny Looney Tune mirrors, how do you call it? The funny mirrors, room with funny mirrors. So in one mirror you're fat, in another mirror you're skinny, in another mirror, whatever. But that's how we see ourselves with everybody that we interact with. And some people are our diagnosis, and some people are our therapy. But in each person that's part of your reality, there's something that needs to be integrated within us that's looking for the healing. The M theory, have you guys heard about M theory, the string theories? Yeah, so I'm gonna be very brief. From 75 to 95, they have five different string theories. They were all correct, but they didn't know which one is the right one. So the Witten came at USC, actually here at LA, and he proposed that all of them are right, and he calls it M theory. And how he described it is so simple. He said, he puts his hand like this, and he said, imagine the young girl sitting in a funny, funny mirror room, or whatever you call it, and in one mirror she sees herself one way, in another mirror she sees herself differently, in every mirror she's a different projection, but it's the same girl. So it's the same theory. M theory actually combines all the other string theories into one, explaining that we are all the same, all one. So, I actually, came here to introduce the fear technique to U.S. market, and I haven't done it yet. <laughs> so I'm just going to go briefly. What we do with the fear technique, we go over a couple of, uh, we go over 27 questions, and we ask a client to, there are questions from psychology. And then what happens, we ask the client the question, the client gives us the answer. We write these answers down. But the answers by themselves are not the solution because the answers are just insights, like, wow, moment, is it possible that I was doing this? Because most of the questions that we have in a fair technique are, what are the thoughts that are in association with this problem? Okay, the thoughts are, I cannot believe this is happening, she's mean, she's this, she's this. Okay, the emotions, the emotions, let's say sadness, disappointment, whatever, where in the body do you hold that emotion? Because every emotion has its own location. Then we ask you, uh, your devastating decisions, those are the causes, What's activated right now? Like, I'm not good enough, I don't belong, I'm not happy, uh, I, everything has to be hard. Whatever this defeating decision is associated with that. Then, we ask you, what are you losing in this situation, and what are you gaining? What's a payoff? Because there's no coincidences, everything happens for a reason. Then, the next question is, what are you avoiding in this situation? How much you identify with certain, like, uh, victim, set, prosecutor, savior? Then we ask you, uh, how other people see you in your reality, P how people see you when they don't know what you're going through, and how they see you when they know what you're going through. Those are completely different things. Then we get into the point of view of other people who are involved in a problem, and that's where everything changes. So what happens is, let's say your partner is in, in association with this problem, and then you say, okay, First we ask you, what do you think that your partner thinks and feels about you, from your point of view? And then we write that down. And then we ask you, what you what's your partner really thinking and feeling about you? And once you get in the point of view of that partner or that other person, then you're experiencing something totally different. And then we ask you, what's the need that's not met by that person? That's a small exercise that we have done, but that does not solve a problem. That just makes you aware that we never have relationships with anybody. We just have a relationship with our constructs and projections. Because how is possible that somebody comes to the session, does a session, solves the problem, and that relationship is transformed completely? So then also we ask you, what's the goal of the emotion? You get in the point of view of the emotion, 
and then you understand why is that emotion in your life, because there's no coincidences. Also, we ask you, what's your hidden agenda? Why are you in that situation? There's no coincidences why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. And then we ask you, what is it you don't want to uh, accept? Who are you punishing to your own punishment? What does this remind you of? Who's the most important person? What do you want them to know? And also, we heal the inner child. That's the most powerful thing, the healing the inner child. Because most people have forgotten who they really are. And then the second thing also that we do is we ask the client to imagine 20-year-old version of themselves, because that 20-year-old version of yourself already has all the answers, already went through that. And through this session, client understands that all answers are already within you. I had one client who said, he's asked, what do you want to ask your older self? He said, I want to ask him when and how did you solve this problem? And then the answer that he got was October 22nd. October 22nd, I'm not going to have this problem. He called me on October 23rd, claiming that he solved it on October 22nd. So that just gives you an idea that everything is already within. It's just that we don't have access to it because we're dealing with all the energy of emotional charge with everything else. Also, another thing that we do is what's going to happen when this problem is completely solved? Uh, do you have any solution and expectations and everything else? And then after these questions, we go to the part of clinical hypnosis where a client understands that all of this is a construct, construct without which we could not leave that, you could not live that story. And then once you understand it's a construct and the core of yourself, it's pure love and peace. And you actually experience that love and peace now when you release that energy. Because through asking questions and getting the answers, we release some sort of energy, not much, but some energy. And that content, the, uh, once we do the integration part, after the clinical hypnosis, that energy becomes released. And you feel more energized and complete and you understand that it's just a concept of the whole, that you are whole, that nothing's really missing. But you, you were so busy, occupied with different identifications, that you couldn't experience who you really are. So what's gonna happen after the fair transformation technique? First of all, during the session, you will experience love and peace. And then after you've done your session, that love and peace will continue. I always suggest 21 session because you don't have just one thing. You have plenty of things to solve. But after 21 session, you, people from your environment will not recognize you and you will not recognize yourself completely. You'll be a completely different person. And not only that, but your subjective reality will no longer be what you were living till you start doing the sessions. So this is not one-time deal. It's something that you learn and you apply whenever you have a problem. I highly recommend, I don't recommend you deal with this and then you heal all your ancestor in the whole world. But when something comes into your life, you sit down, uh, set up the session, and then you solve whatever's bothering you. From that point on, that will no longer be part of your reality, literally. Something that was bothering you till yesterday, after the session will no longer be part of your subjective reality. Because we have so many people who are in Europe who are doing these sessions, when I'm asking them, what did you go through? They can't even remember. Because it literally disappears from your reality. I'll give you an example. There's one woman that I know very well, and she was, uh, her subject was aggression in her family. From that point on, not only she couldn't experience aggression in her family, she couldn't experience aggression anywhere. And I paid attention, like, I will come to her house, and I don't have a TV for plus 20 years, but when I come to her house, she has TV always on. And somehow, I wanted to test it. And then I will put a TV on where there's some violent movie or something. And then when the violent scene shows up, she has to go to the bathroom, to the kitchen, her grandkids will show up or something, but her attention was not longer on any type of aggression, not even in any kind of reality not even in the movies. She, couldn't yet, she simply could not experience that part of her life anymore. And that was a good test for me just to exercise because I was like, you know, she hasn't experienced aggression ever since the session, but I want to see if she can actually witness it. She couldn't even witness it. So that's how it works. And another thing's gonna happen, which is the most important thing and part of this existence, why we're here. That's why I started the way I started. The point of everything is not only you're gonna to get to the source, who you really are, and you're gonna experience that love and peace, but in your life, any person that comes next 
or the person that you're with, if you work with them as well, you will experience that kind of love that you've never experienced before. And that is the love that goes to every direction and actually heals you. It's incredible love. It's not unconditional love. It's not love that just goes to one direction. You give it, and the more you give it, the more you feel it. It goes in every direction. And you are the person that gets so overwhelmed with that love that you literally want to explode with it. Like, it's like a DMT experience, but without any external stimulus, literally. So you feel that, and that changes your whole perspective on life. From that point on, you know who you are, and you know that every person that comes into your life is there in order for you to heal. Through healing you, you heal a whole consciousness, literally. Everything starts within. These are the things you will experience after the fair technique. So, and whatever anybody else in a group heals, you heal yourself as well. It's a group that's so interconnected that um, every time I work with you, another thing is what I have to mention is if I'm a, let's say, therapist and a client or person that does a session and person who, whose session is done on, that it's always done two in one. Whatever I'm working with you, that's something that I'm healing within myself. It's always, always two in one. So when I did it for my uh, public speaking, uh, in 2008, I was chosen to do a TEDx talk in Montenegro. And the night before that, I never done a public speaking before that. And, but it was a subject that I knew upside down. And then when I stand on the stage, I was night before for the, uh, how do you call it, test? The rehearsal. rehearsal. So the night before for the rehearsal, I was sitting there, there was two cameras, there were maybe only 50 people in the first two roles, uh, people who were part of it, organization and everything else, and I sat there, standing on the mic, and I couldn't say a word. It was a subject that I knew upside down. You wake me up at three o'clock in the morning, I could talk about it, but when I was on that podium, I couldn't say a word. So all I remember was that red carpet, the, the lights, the couple of people in front, and that's it, but I couldn't do it. So I canceled that show. I did it two years later, but I did four sessions on myself on public speaking in order for this to be possible tonight so I can speak this freely. You're just removing the blockage from yourself so you can express yourself as anybody else. And that's the thing. So I could talk about these techniques forever, <laughs> as long as needed, but I'm gonna close with this story, which is very um, dear my, very dear friend of mine shared this with me. And it's a story between Benjamin, you know, Benjamin Disraeli and William Gladstone. They were competing for a competition to be a prime minister in, United, uh, in England. And they were asking one lady that has a date with both of them. She had dinner with both of them. And her name is Jenny Jerome. She was actually Winston Churchill's mother. And they ask you, what do you think of one and what do you think of the other guy? She said, when I, when I left her dining room after sitting with Gladstone, I thought he was the cleverest man that she ever met. But when I met, uh, when I met, uh, when I sat next to the Israeli, I left the room feeling that I was the cleverest woman or important woman. So this is about you. This whole thing was about you. There's no coincidences that you hear tonight. There's no coincidences that you've been introduced to this technique because from this point on, you have no longer excuses. Is anybody here who wants to share their experience? I, well, I, I can share an experience. Oh, here, I, I, here's Mike. I actually want to add something. Yes. Um, when you were, because you're such a great speaker and you, you have so much to, to speak that you forgot to say a few practical things about your techniques. And I'm gonna try to add Thank that, you. Uh, you know, fair technique who I adore, and I really love it, and I would recommend it to anybody, is actually a two-person technique. Uh, it's, it, there is a problem. What happens is that uh, I did a compilation between the book that I brought, it's Practical Manual for Changing Subjective Reality, and a technique. So there was not enough time to explain the technique, so I apologize, but the purpose was that. Now let's see, my very first fair experience Oh, oh my God, there's so much to goodness that came out of that. Like my relationship with my mother who loves me very much and who I couldn't feel her love. I really couldn't. Um, yeah, I, I just get emotional about it. But I mean, I did tell her after the technique and everything that I, that I just really couldn't actually authentically feel 
love for her the way I do after. Because, you know, what had happened through the process and when I re realized and uh, limiting beliefs and all of that that happened, I don't even know, like Tatiana says, I can't even remember the, the pinpoint why that happened, but I just, I just know that it happened and I, and I know that that it's great, the relationship, the, the love that I feel for her to this day, right now, and I'm so happy she's here that I can actually share it with her. You know, I can actually authentically feel and, and the joy within me when I'm with her. Another thing, uh, speaking of anger, I'm just gonna say no, that. No, no, please. Uh, anger, okay, so that's a, ah, that's an interesting one because anger is the emotion that I bo uh, like bottled up really well. And it would come up every once in a while, right? In this like wild screams, but I would see it everywhere, right? And I chose a partner who's very angry, you know, a very mm -hmm. angry man. And, uh, and I was like, why don't you, you know, you should do therapy, you should do this, you should do that because you're angry, you know? But oh boy, I'm not angry at all, you know? And so oh, that has changed a lot. I mean, all I have right now, because it's a, it's a never ending process working on oneself, so. I'm not gonna stand here and tell you that all my issues are resolved, but my life is so, so joyful. So much more than I've ever known before in the last couple of years. Thank you. Um, well, I also uh, found out, found Tatiana February of 2020. I mean, we all know what happened in March of 2020, right? And so in March of 2020, I get sick and my boyfriend leaves me. And now I am thinking I'm dying of COVID and I'm dying alone and abandoned. And I mean, you all could probably guess what's my biggest fear in life is being abandoned while I'm sick. Because I happened to be in a hospital when I was one and a half, for about 10 days away from my parents. So that's kind of where that got lodged in. So I was carrying this with me um, to date myself for about 40 uh, plus years. And um, so he leaves suddenly, I'm sick, and I'm progressively getting worse day in, day out. And the doc I go to the doctors and they tell me, you don't have COVID and you don't have flu, but I'm getting worse. I'm coughing so badly that I feel like I'm going to stop breathing. I'm coughing, I can't stop coughing. And I have the group in Europe and they are in Europe nine hours ahead. So I check in with my girls and I'm like, help me save my life, I'm all alone. My friends can't come, everybody's afraid. I, I don't have food. I just, I can barely get up and make some tea or soup and then I'm like back in bed. Um, I, to cut the long story short, I, I did 12 sessions in 12 days. I did one session every day. I had zero fear left in me, not for the rest of COVID. I mean, I'm still like, what COVID? What? What are we talking about? What is this world going crazy about? I like literally have no feeling of fear present in my system. And the feeling of being alone and abandoned is just like gone. I was afraid to be alone. I was a people pleaser and a codependent. I was blaming my ex-husband, I mean my late husband for codependency. Like I have none of those fears of being alone. And that particular ex-boyfriend, like I can't get rid of him. He's like still in my life and keeps, keeps wanting to be around me. Um, so that's just one thing. And then I also worked on issues with my son who was a teenager, you know, stonewalling me and so on. I'm not gonna bore you with details, but like Daniela says, like the issues keep coming because life keeps coming, but I feel like I have a really solid tool on top of my other tools that I can um, really plug in like very, very easily and, um, and get back into balance. Basically, it's all that is. I just get back into balance. And I'm like, oh, okay, I can deal with this. This is no longer a big deal. Anyway, that's... Thank you. You guys have any questions? Yeah. Comments, questions? Yes. So how the, you came up with the team? Okay, so um, that's kind of a long story, but one morning I woke up with a complete technique in my head, and then I shared, because prior to that, I'm, I'm actually in architecture. Architecture is my profession. Those are my projects. And by the way, I have to share this. I developed this patent that you can prefab home for $200 a square, feet, square meter. Anyway, long story short. So I was um, 
in architecture, and then something happened to me, health-wise, and I was paralyzed for three and a half weeks. And then there's this technique that I was talking to you about. And then uh, while I was laying down in bed, I asked the nurse to call one of my colleagues, psychologist in Europe. And she did call a friend, and I said, could you please do a session on me? Because I, you know, when you're laying there, and you're thinking everything and anything, you know, my, my godfather was quadriplegic, so I, that first thing that crossed my mind is I'm gonna end up in a wheelchair. And um, so what happens while she was doing a session on me, I gave a vow that if I ever walk again, that I will spend the rest of my life teaching that technique. And then it didn't, lock, it's not like the next morning I could dance or anything like that. It took me nine months to recover. When I recovered, I posted an ad on Facebook that I'm gonna honor my word, you know, that I'm gonna teach this technique. So I said, I'm gonna post the ad in hope that nobody's gonna come. So first, my first workshop, I had 11 people. The next workshop was 55, and after that it's been in hundreds. And I never advertised. I never put a penny in this. And by the way, all of this that happened here, it just happened by itself. Because I think when it's the right time, technique will find a person as a conduit, not technique, any idea, will come a person to express itself when it's ready. And then one morning I woke up with this technique, which was basically, when you think about it, it has elements of all the, uh, all the psychological movements that I already studied. You know, has some parts of clinical psychology, hypnosis, gestalt. There's a bunch of things in there that are part of it. But the way how it came down to me, I just wrote it down on paper, I shared a bunch of my colleagues, and they're like, oh my God, this is incredible. Who, whose technique is this? And then we call it fair. Then I shared it with my guy, and I'm gonna, that was during COVID. So I said, I'm gonna train 100 people if you promise you're gonna do 100 sessions for free, whoever asks. So we didn't have 100 people, we had 300 people. So we had 90,000 sessions within a period of six months, and all of them were 100% successful. So that was like a case study for us as well. So from that point on, now it's spreading like crazy in Europe because right now I'm from former Yugoslavia, Montenegro. And there are people from my country who live all over Europe, and now they're spreading technique but I'm saying technique spreads itself. When something is good, when you do a session on yourself and you see transformation, people ask you, what are you on? And you see that you're clear. You're not using any external stimulus. You're not using any frequency machine. You're not using anything and you're feeling good. Why? Because these are technique, both of them are dealing with the cause of it. Most of other technologies are dealing with the consequences. When the cause is gone, all the consequences are also gone with it as well. So it, it just, I, I was just a conduit, it has nothing to do with me. When idea is, how many people here have some idea that's great, you haven't done nothing about it, and then you go two years later in a store, they're selling the same idea. So I think none of the ideas are ours, so I'm not taking credit for it. I just think it's a time for consciousness to be a walk. I mean, also, that's also a game. They're all games. With fair technique, you understand that you're playing game, that main game. We all have different unconscious games, main unconscious games. But one game that is, it's in common with all of us, it's a hide and seek. We are all hiding from ourselves by running away from who we really are. And we identify with so many different things that you forget who you are. And through this technique, you go back to your source. You find out your true self. And after that, no matter what people tell you, you know who you are. There's nothing that can get you off track. And you let other people play games with you. But you know who you are, but you let them play their games because after that, there's no more judgment. There's no more suppressing, repressing, or judging. You know why? Because you stop judging yourself. That's it. And you accept everybody's development, whatever they are. It doesn't matter which level they are. You accept them and you love them. And that's all you have to do. And your life changes completely. So that's it. Yes. Thank you. OK. In order to say how grateful I am for, to, for you guys tonight, I would like to remove trauma from your life. Anybody wants to remove any trauma from past? Oh, yeah. <laughs> because I, I said I want to make sure that you guys get something good out of this. You OK? Yeah. OK. So whoever wants to stay, this will be like an extension thing. So now I will do one exercise where you will pick one trauma from your past. Any trauma. Yes.
it, it works, it, yes, it works while you're on it, but when you're off of it, you go back to this old because your core, the core problem is still present. So it's a temporary release, it's a temporary. Yes, like everything else, yes. You're dealing with the consequences. All right, so is anybody here who wants to work on this? Yes. Yes. Okay, so one session of fair technique is literally equivalent to years of therapy. Because all these questions that you go through, you literally, you will have to go years and years of therapy. Clin I'm talking about clinical psychology. What happens when you go to clinical psychology, you might feel good, because every time, this is not a talk therapy, by the way, because every time you talk about something, you feel better. Why? Because you release oxytocin and serotonin, the hormones of happiness. But uh, with this, we just remove energy and emotional charge from something. So, and also another thing has been proven that every time you talk about something, you repeat the story over and over again. Not only that you're experiencing it again, but you are adding more stuff to it that never happened. So you're making it bigger than it is. So that's why you have to go to years and years to clinical psychology because not only you're creating codependent relationship, but you're adding more stuff to the, to the things that you talk about. As Nikola Tesla stated, every time you talk about something or somebody, Whatever you talk about, it all grows, becomes bigger, and even more installing to your psyche. It doesn't go anywhere. So you're making it bigger, like that. With fear, we remove energy and emotional charge from that, and that's no longer part of it. So how long, maybe the question is, how long does it take? The actual session, how long it lasts, depends. An average is two to three hours. But that's equivalent to years of therapy. It's worth it of, of your time. It will, it will definitely transform everything that's bothering you right now. And three hours later, it's no longer part of your life. It's worth it. And it can be done through Zoom because you don't have to. Yeah, you can, you can do it from home. You don't have to go anywhere else. And uh, in Europe, they do it uh, in, depends which country, in like lower, in $300 per session. To five depends because most of my clients are psychologists, psychiatrists, and psychotherapists. So whatever they charge their clients regular, but here's a problem: normally you charge them for a session, whatever you charge them. But when you do the fair technique, that's no longer their problem. So it's not codependent relationship. Yes. But then if you set for three hours, usually Yes. It will, yeah, the technique you will need to session because you never know how much energy and emotional charge each person is holding. So in average, yes. Uh, can I say something? Yes. Any other questions you guys might have? Otherwise, we go to the exercise. Yeah, let's go to exercise. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to go back and choose one trauma from your past. Anyway, I want to say thank you very much for tonight. And... Um, This is the first time I'm doing this in English, so it's totally different than what I'm used to, but thank you for your patience and everything. Thank you. <laughs>